here, uh, present this topic. And uh, the basic idea is, are you present today uh, a personal perspective, a personal view of uh, the, the interest uh, of uh, in, in graph database, the interest in research in graph database that now is coming back again. And the scenario in which it's inserted, uh, which uh, involves data spaces, linked data, ontologies, and so on. So I'll try to, to draw a kind of scenario and, and uh, some specific uh, uh, examples. And uh, I have also practical things that I, is at the end that uh, um, I'm not considering to present today, but if someone is interested afterwards, I can show some how to create uh, uh, graphs in a database. It's kind of 10-minute thing you can learn, and you see how easy it is, OK? Um, so uh, basically, uh, a graph database is not something new in the sense that there are there was research in this topic in the past. Even in the epoch, the other models of database like relational and other models are under research. Okay, so it's not new, but for some period, it was not like a hot topic or something that much people are so interested. And uh, in the last uh, years, there is an increase of interest in this specific kind of database. And I will show you some scenarios that, in some sense, has some relations with this, interest, this increase of this interest. But basically, a graph database is a graph as a basic data model of a database. So there is not uh, too much. Uh, the idea is you don't uh, map your graph to a relational database or something else. You store the graph as it is, OK? And why graphs? This is the question that I try to present now. Why we are talking about this kind of graph? Why not, for example, put the things in a, in a relational database and go ahead, OK? So I'll show some, uh, some uh, Evidence that we need graphs, and it's important to process things like graphs. Okay. For example, uh, I will talk about the web effect, linked data, social networks, and social content, sharing and interconnecting, and complex networks. Okay. So linked data. I don't know if uh, you are, you know the, the the context of linked data, how it born and so on. But I will present you uh, 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 linked data by example, OK? So uh, I, I think you probably know, uh, I don't know if you know, who knows here, we, uh, DBpedia. Who knows DBpedia? One, two, three, four. So uh, DBpedia is something that uh, you, you, you know, Wikipedia. And then you know that Wikipedia has this uh, part we call info boxes, right? And the info boxes, they are really, uh, they have um, some uh, structure which is simple to interpret, OK? So for example, if you enter in the Paris page, OK, you find an info box that uh, tells the country where the city is inserted, uh, the region, and other information. And it's not just information, there are links here. And this link, for example, of Paris brings you to the page of France or to the page of Ile de France, OK? And then in the Ile de France, there are another info box here, OK, with other links. So uh, they are so well organized and structured that a group started to do research. Oh, uh, is it possible to transform it in a way that a machine can interpret and process it? So the Wikipedia basically started to the following. They got this, this uh, data and these links and transformed it in a graph. In fact, it's an RDF graph, OK? So the basic idea is, uh, 
For example, Paris becomes a node, okay, and you have a connection for a connection here. I can call region, for example, to Ile de France, and and so on and so forth. So I start to connect these things, this uh, kind of concepts on the web, on the on on this graph, okay. And one important thing here, which is one of the essences of linked, linked data, is each node is in identified by an URI. Okay, so uh, uh, the identification of each node is unique in the entire world. And why this is important? This is important because if someone in another base, uh, in another computer, wants to connect their data, its data, his data, with something in this base, it just refers to the YHI. Okay? It's just that. It links. So how much they, they have? Okay? In the last statistics I, re I read in the page, they have 4 million things. 3.2. 22 million classified in a consistent ontology. So it's not just nodes uh, without uh, nothing. They are classified, okay? You have, for example, persons, place, creative works, organizations, specimens. So you have access to a huge knowledge base. And uh, you have several languages and they are interlinked with English, okay, so they have really, uh, for example, these automatic translators like uh, Google Translate, they use these links between several languages to do the, the to get the, uh, the translations, okay. So in the beginning, so the, the notion of uh, linked data was launched by Tim Berners-Lee, okay. He proposed that people must uh, put their data uh, uh, open in the web, but try to identify and to refer things using URIs. And what happened is, in 2007, May of 2007, you see other knowledge bases started to uh, connect themselves with the Wikipedia and other bases. So, for example, you have here music brains, which is music, okay? So, you may imagine that a music band is from some city. Instead of put the name of the city, it has a link to the Wikipedia, to the to the URI of the city. Okay. So now you start to have all this knowledge connected, and and since 2007 it's growing. So you have more bases interconnected. You see, November 2007, 2008. 2009, 2010, 2011, and in the site, the statistics stops here, okay? You may imagine that 2013, we have a huge base, okay? And if you see, it's a different kind, I will talk uh, further, it's a different kind of integration, okay? Because here, each base is not concerned in integrate, let's say, schemas, okay? They are not considering, oh, what is the schema of the BP? They must integrate my schema with their schema, or what? No, they are just linking things. But link is an important and relevant way of integrating information. Okay, so this is the first uh, thing. Th then there is social networks and social content. Okay, so uh, I this is the thing that now we have things produced in networks, okay? Uh, so, considering that you are looking for a word like pet on the web, okay, not uh, not on the web, but on the on a social uh, uh, on a on a portal that has content, but behind a social network, okay. So, like uh, uh, Flickr, Flickr has pictures, right? And people can put pictures, and uh, they can tag it, and uh, they they can connect themselves, okay. And you are looking for pet, and what happens can be this word pet has several meanings. For example, can be pet shop boys, but probably you are not looking for pet shop boys, I think. 
but uh, can can have uh, other uh, interpretations. Okay, and uh, here, for example, if you look on these squares here, consider these are images I retrieved from the Flickr. Okay, it, they are real cases. Okay, if you read other tags together, them you can see which kinds of uh, pets we are talking about, right? In this context, which kind of pets we are talking about? It's easy, right? Animals, okay? Cats, dogs, and these things, okay? And you interpret the, the context of pet based on the other tags. Here, you see the word pet also, but you have another context. You see the tags. And probably you see, okay, here is not uh, a dog or a cat or not uh, an animal, right? Plastic bottle, recycle, okay? So there is another meaning for pet. In fact, the first group uh, you see are animals, okay? And the group, second group are uh, these pet bottles in plastic you use, okay? So you, uh, uh, can we... Uh, getting this data and analyzing the connections, can we extract from it some kind of, in, in, or, or, of uh, semantics, okay? So there are several works in this area that represent these things as a graph, considering that you have users, tags, and resources, okay? And then you, you analyze the connections between them, okay? You have a graph here. And let's say uh, one important thing is what we call co-occurrences, when some tags appear together, okay? So, for example, you can use co-occurrences to define context. So, I will see that the word, the tag pet here, okay, has one kind of uh, meaning, let's say, which is different from the tag pet here, okay? I don't need to even know or interpret the other words, I don't know, I don't know that cat is uh, an animal or dog, doesn't matter, okay? I know that frequently these um, tags appear together and produces a kind of context for pet, and this one produces another content for pet. And I can transform, as several related work do, I can transform it in graph, okay? where the edges are uh, the, the, the co-occurrence and how strong they are, okay? And producing these graphs, I can have, uh, can have nodes representing some meaning for pet, okay? Uh, but uh, we can go further. There are several works in this area that try to see, can we extract from this, network, some kind of taxonomy, okay? So, uh, the basic notion, people started to word the, use the word folksonomy. The idea of folksonomy is a kind of uh, uh, taxonomy that raises from the social interaction, okay? And it's organic, okay? It's not something that someone starts to design, okay? It, it comes from the people, let's say organically. So they started to look on that and several works started to see, for example, when you see these co-occurrences, you see that probably pet here, okay, is generalizing these other tags here, okay, because pet appears always, with, uh, cat with pet, dog with pet, so pet, pet probably generalizes here and animal generalizes uh, not just pet but other kinds of the animals that are not pet. So just looking on that, there are authors that show they can produce, just looking on the tags, uh, a taxonomy, okay? And, and they are really, the results are really good, are really good. If you see the results, you are impressed at how it makes sense, okay? In fact, there are some mistakes because, for example, sometimes it's not a generalization. Sometimes it's something that appears, for example, I. And I appears in, in these three animals, okay? So it will appear together, and then uh, it can appear that an I is a generalization of them, but it's not. It's part of them. So it's not perfect, okay? But they produce really interesting results, 
okay and they can enhance and improve search of these animals because in some sense they are producing a kind of semantics there okay and uh, another important thing which is the most important thing when you look on social networks is the reinforcement if you are looking on a social network uh, in, in several cases okay several authors tag the same resource is not the case of Flickr. Flickr doesn't do that, but there are other social networks. Let's say, if you go to Delicious, which is a social network for bookmarks, okay, you tag, you get a bookmark and you tag, okay. But another person can 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 put the same, get the same uh, you, uh, address and also tag it. But what happens is that Delicious start to suggest. Because it goes and see, oh, most of the people are using this tag, and so it starts to suggest. And when it suggests, it reinforces. So, in some sense, the tag cat here will appear as highly important because, say, thousands of users for the same resource use the same word. So, it's not just words, are words with some weight and the relation between tag cat and kitty kitty here is highly important for some reason okay so this is very important and uh, i have an, i had a student that we did a kind of survey on this kind this uh, work and most of them follow the same uh, steps first they produce a graph and this graph has weights connecting uh, nodes here, okay, and uh, tags in this case, tags, and the weight is the weight of co-occurrences, okay. There are variations, but most of them start from that, okay. And the second step, most of them do the following. They try to get tags have, that has the same meaning, the same concept, and put them together. So, for example, they usually the words we read, they use some auxiliary dictionary or, or thesaurus or something. So they, what they find, they try to find the root of the words and synonyms and put them together. So now our graph will not have tags anymore, but uh, in some sense, some kind of concept. Okay? So now our graph becomes a graph of concepts here. Okay? with weights relating them, okay? So, from this graph, uh, several works show they can, in some way, produce a kind of social ontology, okay? Folksonomy, it depends on the author, how they call, they, they name it, okay? But, we, in our paper, we show it that all words, uh, all works, the most they achieve is generalization and specialization. They, they, they don't go further, okay? For example, they cannot find relations like part of, okay? It's hard to find these things. Uh, if you go to an ontology, if you think an ontology li like a graph where you have concepts and uh, relations with some, say, uh, explicit meaning, you have other relations besides uh, generalization, specialization, you can have part of, you can have other kinds of relations, okay? And in our work, this is just uh, what we proposed is uh, we want, instead of producing uh, uh, an ontology from the tags, okay, we mix it uh, data collected from social networks on an existing ontology, okay? Which kind of data? The weight of correlations, and I'll show you the frequency in which this concept appeared in the data. And this frequency <coughs> will be used further to compare similarity, okay? So, so I will jump this thing here. Now, so this is two, two motives, okay? Uh, we, we need graphs in several contexts, but 
Uh, why not, for example, storing things, storing graphs in any kind of database, OK? So uh, <coughs> sharing and interconnecting are some uh, motives I will show you. First, let's consider models to describe things. So let's consider I want to describe something. In this case, I got a dinosaur, OK? It's not a dinosaur, a prehistoric animal. <coughs> Pleosaurus, probably you don't know it, right? OK, it's OK. But uh, uh, there is an animal here. <laughs> and there is a number here is identifying it in a museum, OK? This is the origin, OK, uh, when it was recognized, the size, and so on and so forth. It's a marine. Uh, people think that the monster of Loch Ness is a plesiosaurus, just to, just to, to know. OK, so let's consider I have several of these dinosaurs here, our prehistoric animals and dinosaurs. And I want to, in some sense, store them, OK? OK, a classic approach will be a table, OK? A relational database with a table with our data. Everybody knows that. I don't need to spend time to explain that, OK? I just define a schema, OK? And then I start to put my data there, OK? But a table, it's excellent to manage data with predictable static schema, OK, or almost stable schema, something that you don't change too much, OK? It's excellent to do that. So it's not, I'm not replacing, but when, the, when you do want to do that, it's excellent. But there are two contexts. First, when you want to do connections, Without uh, outside the schema is one problem. The second problem is when you want to share. Why I'm telling when you want to share? Because a database, like an, a relational database, you have your tables there, and they have connections. You normalize it, OK? If you want to get this data and give it to someone, OK, it's hard to use this model to share the data, OK? Because <coughs> You must give everything, <laughs> or how you do that. So people started to share data, started to use XML, OK? And why XML? XML is, is nice because it's a document, OK? It's, we, are, we are used to do that, OK? I, we put our reports in a document. You put all the data you need in this document, something hierarchical, and you give it to someone in the physical world. So it's, it's easy to imagine that we can do that. OK, and XML standardizes uh, several aspects of syntactic interoperability, OK? And then you can uh, put all the data you want of the, your dinosaur here uh, in your XML schema and share. But what happens is something we call, in some sense, normalization in databases. But also, we can tell, uh, for example, OK, but if I have documents, XML documents here, I want to tell that this Plesiosaurus here, this species here, are the same of this one. This Lyme region, region, which is a region, is the same of this one, and so on and so forth. So what happens when you see XML standards, and when you see people happy in using these standards to, to, to store and to share their data, if you go on that, uh, you see that, in some sense, you start to use a mechanism of XML. For example, can I, in XML, can I connect these two things? Yes. I can define something and do an age reference. So I can refer things. I can do these connections. But what happens when you do that a lot uh, is that you do, then you see why I'm using an hierarchical structure to do something which is, in fact, not hierarchical, OK? So the problem is, how much hierarchical is your data, OK? So you start to work on these XMLs, but you start to use these uh, references between things. And you start to see, OK, but this is not exactly an hierarchical data. This is much more a graph, OK? 
But then in this specific, uh, so okay, so then in this specific case, we can go back to the, our relational database because the relational databases are good on that. You have foreign keys, you have, uh, okay, joins, and you can do that. But there are another problem in uh, the relational database, not just relational database, but any, any model where you have a strong schema, okay, which is, you need, when you want to do other kinds of relations that are not pre-designed in your schema, let's say, you want to relate, you want to tell that these two names here are from the same animal but in two different versions. Or you want to tell that this guy includes this guy here. Or you want to tell that this region is nearby this region here. Or you want to tell that these numbers here are in fact from some museum. Okay? If you want to do that, you have the only one option. You must change your schema to afford these new requirements. Okay? So you start becoming crazy because every time you appear someone, you know, I need this thing here, so you must change again your schema and change again your schema and not just the schema, the applications, because usually the applications are some dependency on the schema and then uh, they could break if you don't you are not careful enough. If you want to interrupt to tell something, please feel free to do comments, right? Because I'm putting here a, a, a really a, an aggressive position. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's important to tell here that uh, this is not argument to tell you uh, graph databases will replace everything is, is beautiful. No, because I showed the, 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 the the other side, they have collateral effects, okay? It's like just to tell that there are some scenarios, there are some cases in which using graph database will be better than use other models, okay? So we have a kind of trade-off when you use static schemas. Static schemas, they are in fact very good if you want to have some control of how you store and you manage your data, and there are several cases, or probably most of the cases, in which you want this kind of things, okay? But they will be a problem when you want free to interconnect things. And people from XML standards are also seeing this problem of schemas. Because, for example, this is a study in biology of several open standards that must be related by themselves, but they are not. And the problem is, each time you tell, okay, we have these two standards here, for example. Can we put them together? Then you define a committee and spend years to see how this schema will fit in this schema. Because XML is not well designed to uh, afford uh, relations with other schemas. Okay? It can do that. But you must preview the points in which you accept other things. It's not easy. Okay? So this is our problem. And then in this context, uh, a group started talking about data spaces. What is the notion of data spaces? Okay. Uh, in my point of view, uh, the notion of data spaces has a strong relation with the notion of linked data. Okay. Uh, you see, uh, this paper talk, it's an interesting paper to read about that spaces, and the basic idea is the following. Uh, we are, when we talk about database integration, we are used to talk about schema integration, schema interoperability, and there are several approaches to do that. We can align the schemas, we can produce something on top of that, we map both the schemas, and there are several ways to do that. But in all cases, we spend time and energy trying to fit one schema to the other to tell how this is interpreted on the other side. It takes, this takes a lot of energy, time, and so on and so forth. And sometimes it's too much. Because now we are in a scenario, in an organization, where we have several kinds of data. We have XML things, we have uh, uh, relational databases, we have uh, web services, and so on and so forth. And it will be interesting if we can integrate them. Everybody likes that. Could I, I integrate these things with my documents, or with this one, or this, so forth, so on and so forth. And then people start to think, how do you do that? 
So the notion of data spaces is first there is pay as you go integration. What is pay as you go integration? The basic notion is instead of predefining a strong way to integrate things in advance before you 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 do the thing, you start to do in small incremental steps you do in steps of integrations, okay? So in several cases, these small steps of integration mean uh, links, for example. So instead of uh, aligning schemas, I can start linking things, okay? And for each step or for it, so you may imagine in a company that can start the following, okay? Let's identify things using UIs, for example. And then we can start to get the bases and put them together and refer to each other. This is a kind of base as you go integration, because you start that and then you want more. Now I need to know these classes must be uh, uh, compatible with these classes and so on and so forth. Okay? So this is, has a strong relation and high impact in the way you see things as graphs, in which you, you are not considering to do uh, strong integrations of things, but you want to integrate uh, dynamically. It's not, uh, the data space is not necessarily related to graph databases, okay? There are several proposals, people are talking about that. Uh, they are still working on a probable architecture there are people trying to propose some kind of architecture, okay? But uh, uh, it's still a work in progress. It's not related to a specific model, okay? So this is about the relation of data spaces and linked data. And at the end, I want to talk about complex networks. I don't know, I don't know probably some of you uh, know about this subject. I know that there is a group in LIP6 of complex networks, right? I saw that. And <coughs> complex network is something that uh, we have a collaboration with a professor in Sao Paulo which works with complex networks. And it's a field that uh, in, since 1999 uh, started to really uh, steadily grow. And uh, the basic notion is discrete systems are rep can are represented in terms of entities and relationships. Uh, and in this case, graphs. Okay? So graphs here, uh, so here is an example of one student, uh, my advice, uh, relating things like, here we have uh, diagnosis, here we have patients, and in the middle, symptoms. Okay? And the challenge here is to define for a given patient, if I look for a, a given symptom, okay, what is the most probable uh, diagnosis I can reach. And why this is important? This is important because in nursery, this, is, this work we did with uh, uh, the nursery of a uh, hospital at Unicamp, the importance of this for nursery is when they are feeling this, this uh, 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 record of the patient, okay? There are hundreds of fields, okay? But uh, usually they don't feel everything because it's too much, okay? So how do you guess, how will they follow to find the things they must ask, the thing they must feel? So this is something that they are interested They uh, there. So in complex networks, you can have, um, you can have <coughs> uh, graphs uh, considering physical relations, like neurons could be nodes and connections could be edges. You can have forced relationships like grains, and Luciano is doing an, an interesting research on that. Grains could be nodes and forced vectors could be edges, and you can look on that. Social relationships, conceptual relationships. Here are some exa interesting examples. This is the the network of uh, relations and appearances in the Le Miserable, okay, of the, the characters, okay. 
And uh, here is a, a complex network studying uh, the freshwater food web. You see, it's always a graph and something here is this uh, contagion of tuberculosis, okay? And uh, yeast proteins. So uh, they, uh, at the end, what they are looking for? We have a lot of uh, graph algorithms we developed it in the last years that are highly useful, okay, to find some uh, characteristics in these networks, okay. So how can we exploit them to, uh, uh, in these graphs, okay? Okay, so uh, consider that you are convinced uh, we can put things in a graph and store in a database, okay? What can I ask to a graph? Okay, so this is a simple example just to show something important. For example, I have my dinosaur again, and I put my dinosaur in a graph, okay? This is a model of graph. I will talk a bit afterwards. This model is the RDF model in which we have just nodes which can be labeled, okay? Edge and nodes, okay? And when, when they are final, they are like that, and when they are in this shape, they can be connected again with other nodes and so on and so forth. So in this case, I'm describing this dinosaur. I have the size when it was recognized and its origin, okay? And then I want to connect it to, to a kind of graph which can give me uh, the regions in the world, okay? So I can look to see where exactly is Lens Creek. It's not just a label. I want to connect it to a network here, okay? Fair enough. And another dinosaur has the same thing, okay? The same Hell Creek and all the edges on top. And now I want to do some requests, considering that I want to know, okay? For example, if they share some region and if it's possible to know that in some sense they interacted, okay? So in some sense here, and this is typical query of a graph, Okay, because if you, if you try to imagine that in a relational database, it's like each level here will be a join. Okay, it's a kind of query we call recursive query. Okay, you go ahead until you find what you want in some level there. Okay, so here I want to know if in some region here they can be together. Okay, and uh, so this is the thing I want to know. Okay, and there are two ways to do that. Uh, okay, so one impo important thing, just and, and, and something in the middle is, uh, you can tell me, okay, but where do you get this data? So if you go to, again to the approach of linked data, which I'm using a lot with my students, there are, for example, a one knowledge base we call GeoNames, which has all the world, okay, represented as a big graph, with relation like this is uh, part of that, or this is administratively inside of that, and so on and so forth. You can have everything you want. So for example, if I want, and this is a kind of linked data integration or data spaces integration, if you wish, I can tell, okay, this dinosaur here, the origin is this OHI here, which is Lance Creek. And in the geonames, I can get relations to know that is inside the United States. Okay, uh, then how can I do this, how I do this kind of query when graph database is involved, okay? There are two ways to do that. The first way is uh, we call process by pattern, okay? Because in graph database you see that we don't have a schema. There is no, the notion of schema is outside of the scope in the sense that we just produce the graphs with labels and put on the storage, okay? Then, uh, how can I query it? I query it based on patterns. For example, I can do a query like find the species whose origin is uh, part of in one or several levels of the United States. Here it is in Portuguese, sorry, it's the United States here, for example, okay? So, uh, 
and I can express exactly that in 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 the so in uh, the query languages in, in in graph database. And if you have time, I can show you some practical examples. Are basically pattern matching. Okay, since we don't have schemas, we are not relying on any schema. We try to match patterns of the labels of the things we are looking on the graph. Okay, another way to do the thing is if your graph becomes something like an ontology. Okay, so for example, if you are working with RDF, this is much more an ontology, and then you can start doing inference. Okay, so for example, I can produce rules telling that if the origin A uh, is if A uh, it has origin B, and B is part of C, so A has origin C. And I can also tell if A is part of B and B is part of C, A is part of C. It's a transitivity, OK? So in this case, my query will be simple. Find a species whose origin is United States. And by applying these rules, it will find the correct answer, OK? The difference here is this is quicker. This is much quicker. This is more expensive, take much more time, OK? But from the user point of view, this is easier because I just ask what I want. And the system uses the rules to interpret the things. So for example, it's something the semantic point of view is obvious, the transitivity of part of. Okay? So I just uh, give the system the enough uh, information to do that. Okay? So uh, a third way, a third thing, the uh, second thing is look on the topology, OK? And topology is something that several researchers and even much people in complex networks are looking. So this is a hot topic now, how to find things looking on the topology of the network. And I don't know if everybody's used it with the notion of topology, but I can the simplest word to explain that is page rank. Okay, page rank is a relevance topology way. For example, I'm looking for some relevant uh, node, uh, considering some keyword or something. And what Google did? Google developed an algorithm in which I define the importance of this guy based on mm, as is the most pointed, let's say, uh, node in the graph, considering this specific keyword. And this is impressively in, uh, efficient. This is efficient, no, but this is impress impressively uh, has relevant results. So Google showed us that this can be really something that can help us a lot. And it become a kind of uh, analysis of topology in the network, right? Which is interesting. And now we can apply the same approach to analyze uh, spread of some health thing or uh, how ne neurons behave or how social networks work or to do some kind of uh, um, uh, uh, some kind of uh, to advise some product or something based on the relations, or if you enter in that book, uh, in Facebook, they will decide which news are more important and analyze the topology of the network. Another thing is when we have nodes that are, for example, a bridge between other nodes. Okay, so for example, uh, in this graph you can see that there are nodes here. Okay that almost this cluster pass through this node. It's a kind of bridge here, OK? And why this is important, for example, to analyze the spread of uh, some uh, disease, or to analyze, the, to analyze the influence of some people in some communities. Sometimes I am a bridge that gets news here and, and tell people here. I saw a work looking on that in Twitter, for example, to show how people influence and so on and so forth. OK? Uh, here, the, the work I showed you uh, of my students 
looking on the the, the relations of uh, uh, patients, uh, symptoms, and diagnosis. Okay, and uh, uh, what uh, he started to do. So this is my uh, uh, PhD student. He is developing a query language to express topology requests. Okay, so I want to look for some node that has high relevance. Okay, for example, how can I express that in a query? Because the graph query language, they are not prepared to do this kind of query yet. So how can I do that? Okay. Uh, another work I am interested is how we can go from data spaces to ontologies, the notion of data spaces to ontology. So in my point of view, uh, and this is something that I think is happening now in the linked data, is when we think in ontologies, okay, there are a way in which you think, okay, there is a group there that design and, and do in advance an ontology, okay? To deploy it, but how much it represents the knowledge and the things that the community, the people is interested, or how much it really represents the, the the things people think. So another way of doing these things, and I'm interested in that, is getting from the resources and looking on latent semantics on things, relations and connections, and try to extract and to integrate things based on the semantic I can get from the graphs. Here is an interesting project we did. We got uh, 11,000 spreadsheets and we extract the data and transform it. We recognized some schemas and so on. We transform it then in a graph. In our case, an RDF graph. Okay. And we used this graph to integrate the data of these spreadsheets. And how we did that? OK, first, we automatically try to uh, do entity resolution, for example. Find the, this kind of uh, spreadsheets that are from biology, OK? So in the case of entity resolution, we are looking for, for example, the same species in two spreadsheets, or if they are talking about the same region in the world. And in this case, we assess uh, knowledge bases in the linked data approach like uh, geo, geo names to, to, to see if some uh, one in the spreadsheet mentions some city or some state or some place. Why is it? Which region is it? Try to kind of geo-reference it, okay? And there are another interesting service in which you can give uh, the, the name of the species and it will give you back an OAI and an ID to, uh, concerning these species. And uh, we show it that, for example, we can even combine uh, information on several spreadsheets, and uh, we got those kinds of data which has some kind of georeference, not necessarily coordinates, but can be the name. And we go to geonames, get the, the. And for example, I click here and I get a bird, and I can have all information I got of. Uh, 11,000 spreadsheets about this bird. Okay, you can tell me what's the reliability of this data. It's almost zero, okay, because I got in the web like Googling, okay? But it, this is just to show that it's possible to do that. We can do, we can connect information and we can, uh, and uh, reliability in the sense, uh, uh, the system was, the system showed to be consistent in the sense that we verified the connections he did, and they are consistent. The problem is the, the, what is the reliability of the source. If this information is something that we can uh, afford, uh, look on that or not, but we can think something like is a kind of uh, crowd sourcing here. We can try to get information on the web and see how it fits in the things. This is another work uh, together with the uh, Natural History Museum here in Paris, okay, in which they have uh, uh, phenotype descriptions of animals. 
And they start that in XML files which are is, is, are not uh, integrated. Okay. So uh, biologists do that in, independently. Okay. And they uh, one thing they they would like to do is how can we integrate these descriptions? Because for example, we have here several biologists that work with the same genus of a lizard. We call the genus is Varanus. Okay, so all these seven biologists produce some knowledge base about it in XML, and they are not integrated. Okay, so we started to work on, with them. For example, first, uh, you see that we have several distinct graphs here. Okay, and we want to put them together. And so the first thing we did was entity resolution again. So we started to see which kinds of uh, which kinds of uh, species are the same species, and we put the nodes together. After that, now we are developing with the biologists some algorithms to see if, for example, they use characters to describe these living things. Okay, and looking on the structure of the the, the graph, looking on which species the character is connected, what is the states of the species, which are also part of the graph, can we, can we infer which one is talking about the same character, okay? So the, the, the idea is try to exploit the latent semantics, the things we have in the network of data, and automatically assist the biologists to put their data together, okay? One interesting thing is uh, uh, how we evaluate similarity of things. Uh, you remember that I showed you uh, that my student got from the social networks a lot of uh, data and injected it in an ontology, showing the, 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 uh, how the frequency of some concept and uh, so on and so forth. And this is interesting if I want to analyze the similarity of terms. Okay, so for example, consider I want to know if judge is more similar to a child or to a district attorney. Okay, so if I want to analyze that, uh, there are several approaches to do that. Like, let's count how many edges I have. But you see that you, you get the wrong result here because judge is much more similar to a district attorney, okay? In this case, seems to us, right? Uh, I don't know if you know the notions here, but both are work with uh, justice and so on and so forth. So, but if you count edges here, one, two, three, and you count edges here, one, two, three, you think they are the same, okay? But then another approach is uh, can we see the common ancestor and see, for example, the common ancestor of ju judge and district attorney is this one, and from child and judge is this one. Which one is more general, which one is more specific? If I find someone more specific, I can tell that these two guys here are more related. The problem in this specific ontology here, and this is a real case, there is no connection between them besides entity, which is the most generic uh, thing in the ontology. So we cannot evaluate, compare them in this case. Okay. So Hesnik, which is a proposed uh, solution in which you may imagine the size of the universe. For example, uh, official functionary. This this is a kind of universe of things, right? And this is, has a size, which is, let's say, all the official functionaries that exist. And this is another universe, which is all persons in the world. Okay? So in the ontology, they don't appear like that. But in the real world, if we think they are sets with sizes, will be something like that. All persons in the world and the, the, the official functionary. Okay? For this reason, you consider that judge is more similar to district attorney. Why? Because they share a really smaller word than judge and child. Okay? And to do this kind of evaluation, has Nick showed that if you analyze the probability of existence of something in ontology, 
and we find the roots and compare these probabilities, we can see that judge, so in this case, the probability of existence of this guy is much lower than that. So we can see that these two guys is more related, more similar than these two guys. This is the basic idea. There are other, another example here of uh, virus and plants to show this thing, but the concept is the same. If you can evaluate, this thing is, is OK. OK? So this is the, uh, the, the basic thing I want to, to show you, OK? Uh, if you want to see practical details, I can show you. I have, I, I don't know, more 15 minutes. If you are interested, I can show you some queries and commands in graph database, OK? But uh, we can also finish. You can do questions, and uh, you, you, it's open. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So someone have questions, want to ask something about this thing, the subject? I have hmm. a question about, you showed certain things about algorithms. You have, there are algorithms to predict it, and then you have these graph database languages, like what you showed, the graph pattern languages and all this. If you look at problem how to mix these things, so for example, for evaluating similarity that you showed, it's more an algorithm because you you have to search for this common ancestor or all these kind of things. Yeah. So the main thing is how to mix that, how to use a graph database efficiently to implement these algorithms. Yeah. So because in general they are not operations that are directly So do these things. If you look at implementation, so it is, I, I think that you use graph databases, you use this kind of thing. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. So we forget how you need to implement algorithms. Yeah, so what we do is the following. Yeah, uh, 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 I have, for example, the experience of my student who, he, who is doing the topology thing, OK? Which is something in some sense related to what you are asking because when you look on topology is each kind of topology you want to look is an algorithm is a different algorithm so so the first problem is how to put in a, in a kind of general framework all these things you want to look okay and and then he worked with spread activation which is a way you, you use a, a, a force and you spread on the network so he he designed it the solution doing uh, all uh, expressing all the all the kind of uh, topology metrics in spread activation terms. Okay, but then a second a second challenge is, as you told, there are the the graph query languages and how you exploit them. Uh, until now, our solution is the following: we 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 have our he extended the query language. Okay. But to, to implement the solution, he uh, first uh, extract the subgraph which fits on the, on the first part of the query, okay? which fits on the match you put there. And in this graph, he applies the spread activation to get the topology he wants and to, and to, and to give back. But this is a kind of uh, algorithm to do that. Okay? So uh, this solution is, in some sense, is not the best one. Because it's two-step solution, it's easier to implement, but it's not uh, as efficient as you want. Because when you went to the graph to, to, to match the things, you, uh, you could do something in this moment, OK? And we, are not, we don't know yet how to do that, OK? So in this case, is the problem. Better matching is not efficient for many algorithms, for many problems. No, no. It, 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 yeah. yeah. It's something that it's something that uh, we are trying to 
we are trying to see if we can fit everything in the same uh, framework of ideas, you know? It's hard because it is, for example, They, 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 uh, they uh, you can, for example, index things, okay? So if you want to be faster, for example, uh, then uh, you can, for example, you can give to the nodes what we call labels, which is we classify the nodes, and we can produce indexes for classes of nodes, okay? So uh, sometimes if you are looking for something which is belongs to a specific class, you go to this index and it's faster. So this is the way they use to, to, to because the statistics you mean in the sense of how to, how to improve the, yeah. Ah, okay, okay, okay. If you want to answer some, yeah, but, but, but if you see this, the languages, they are really simple, okay? They don't have too much things, okay? I can show here. It's, they are really simple in the things they do. They don't have too much things. And now there are people looking, ah, oh, can you produce a kind of layer on top of them to, to give to the user more things like uh, looking on the, how many edges are, uh, you know, you have, or for example, the length of an edge or something, you know, connectivity, connectivity and the things, right? So this is the, the challenge, right? But the thing is, which is highly important is, there are several kinds of queries you do now, which are network queries, okay? So we are looking for these things, in, and, and they are much more efficient in a graph database. Because if you try to design and implement the same thing in a relational database, you have a, a chain of joints, okay? Which, which the relational database is not designed to do that. Even though this is still under discussion, in the sense that well, uh, whenever I talk about that, there are people that tell me, you know, I did the same thing in a relational database and it was faster. But the thing is, there are some problems in these comparisons now. First is the, the, the existing graph databases are new. In the sense they don't have the history of uh, uh, Oracle or MySQL or something like that. So. So they are not, they don't exploit all the hardware and stuff to be as uh, efficient as this database. This is the first thing, right? Is, is so even though uh, uh, the, the approach in, the, in which you, you do the things could be quicker, there are things of, uh, specifically things you don't exploit yet. And the second thing is sometimes people tell me, oh, you know, for example, one time I was discussing with a researcher that told me, I, I have an ontology, and I put in a graph database, and the results are really, really, really bad. In the sense, comparing with a relational database, the relational database is much better. And then we started to talk about that, and it, uh, it depends what you call a graph, okay? Because an ontology could be a graph, but many people get their relational database, okay, and start to express things as ontologies. For example, this table here, this entity becomes a class, and so on and so forth. So at the end, the result you have is much more like tables and relations than a graph. There is a, some graph structure, but you are not, in fact, exploiting the potential of the graph. So if you are using this thing, even though you are putting in a graph database, the results are not so good as a relational database. Okay. So this is things must be considering considered in this case. Okay. Okay. So so this is the, the and there are models for graph databases, okay? Uh, so here for example, just a quick show here, there are the RDF model which you put everything as uh, nodes and edges, you don't put, uh, you cannot put properties here in the nodes, okay? This is the RDF way of doing things. This, ha this is simple, but is, uh, it takes a lot of overhead, okay? And there are the property graph that is highly used now. Neo4j, which is a database, has this property. You can put properties 
in the node and properties in the edges. So for example, here you have an example. You can have uh, uh, each node with not edges, not nothing. They are properties of the nodes. And you can even have edges with extra properties. Okay? The advantage of this approach is if you use uh, correctly the property is, uh, I think, is, has less overhead. But on the other hand, uh, it's not as simple as, uh, as the other model. Okay. So there are these, there are these uh, trade-offs here of these two models. Okay. Yeah, this is for everything. A killer engine, right? Yeah, you are right. Uh, 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 I, I I saw these things. I don't have. Uh, this is a good question. I don't have exactly the 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 details of which kinds of applications. But if you have something, I'm interested in looking at it. I read something not so. Uh, organized or structured telling about these things. The, the, the books that uh, present the models, there are books, good books that uh, now, uh, there is one that is from Orio, I think, which is a free book of graph database. It's really good. And, and uh, it, uh, it, uh, they show some scenarios. It, it is interesting. I don't have the data now to, to tell you, but you are right. I think it, one thing is uh, the models are, you can map one model to the other. So it, so it is not a kind of problem of expressivity, OK? So you can map an RDF model to a property graph and vice versa. And there are also the hypergraph model they, they show sometimes. Uh, so they can be mapped. I think it's a matter of how easy you, you in a specific context, you express the things you want, and uh, and how efficient it is to a specific kind of operation. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you are right. Yeah. For example, a classic example I, I like to show here is this one, in which, for example, uh, you have an edge and you have a property of the edge. And how you do that in an RDF graph, OK? In RDF graph, you cannot do that. So usually in RDF, when you want to do something like that, what we do, we produce a kind of uh, uh, node here, OK? Uh, so this guy origin now goes to this node, and this node has these two, uh, these two edges. So as you told, when you start to map things, you in some kind you you have some, okay. So for example, if in your problem it is highly important to have edges with these labels and so on, you may you would like to tell, okay, I would prefer to use some property graph because it's easier to do these things. It's important to me, so it's. Okay, but you are right. But I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I, I didn't went deep in these things because now, for example, I, I use. I know RDF because I work a lot with ontologies, so it's a graph that I know since the beginning. And now I'm working with property graphs because there is the Neo4j, which is a, an excellent database for graphs. 
and they were use property graphs. So, so I, I know these two things, but I don't have this knowledge of the several contexts and the best for each case. Thank you very much.